Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. We recently did a video explaining what the Rebellion could do with those 80 million credits from that heist on Aldani. In that video I disclosed information about how much Starfighters cost, for instance a new X-Wing costs around 150,000 credits to assemble, and used Y-Wings cost only around 60,000 credits. We calculated the galactic credit and US dollars exchange rate by taking a look at similar commodities and comparing the prices. We found that the exchange rate was close to one to one. Now there were a lot of sharp eyed viewers out there who commented that hey these prices don't actually match up or make any sense. I mean how could a starfighter's price be as cheap as a luxury automobile here on earth? Especially when a starfighter's closest real life comparison on Earth is a fighter jet, and those cost millions of dollars. A lot of people mention the F-35 program, which actually has a target price of a whopping $80 million per unit. What the hell is going on here? Why are Star Wars ships so cheap? Or did I miscalculate my conversion rates? Well, I'll be honest with you guys, I'm pretty terrible at math, but for an Asian, which means I'm still pretty good at math. I'm a bit sloppy, maybe. The one-to-one -one rate is accurate. What's wrong is the comparison between an F-35 and an X-Wing. They might serve vaguely similar purposes as multi-role fighter aircraft or spacecraft, but their production process and the economics around how they're being built are completely different. Now, before we can explain that though, a quick word from our sponsor for today's video, Bloodline, Heroes of Lythus. A free mobile RPG game where you build your kingdom and collect champions to defend it. What's unique about this game though is in its name, Bloodline. There's a built-in courting and marriage system that allows you to combine different characters and make new baby champions that will continue your legacy and of course, Bloodline. With over 800 different hybrid combinations, you can build a huge range of different types of characters, mixed traits, appearances, and skills that you like. And starting October 27th, there's going to be a free Halloween event. You'll be given a free vampire champion on the seventh day of your journey. If you use my link down below or scan the QR code on screen to install Bloodline, you'll also get a free starter pack that's worth $20. It includes 10 energy potions, 100,000 gold, and 100 diamonds. Thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. So the first thing we have to realize is that the Force is not the most powerful thing in the galaxy. It's actually human ingenuity paired with the free market. It is both awe-inspiring and terrifying at the same time. And one of the most important inventions in the 20th century, which exponentially sped up technological development and industrialization, was the creation of mass production, thanks to the assembly line. Many people attribute this creation to Henry Ford and his assembly lines at the Ford Motor Company. I consider this America's greatest gift to the world, and some might argue that it is America's greatest curse to the world. But it's really not that surprising that a nation of hungry immigrants who just escaped the poverty of the old world would create one of the most potent industrial concepts in human history, so I guess that they would never starve again. With the creation of his moving assembly line for automobiles in Highland Park in 1913, Henry Ford was able to reduce the cost of his Model T car from $850 per unit to $260 per unit. In today's money, that's a reduction from $25,500 to $7,800. This is extremely significant. The price here drops to less than a third of what it used to be. And just to give you a little more context, the average person earned around $750 a year, which adjusted for inflation for today would be around $22,500. So all of a sudden, the Model T became affordable to the average American family. It no longer costs the average year's salary to buy a car, now it's just around a third or a fourth of a year's salary. In 1912, before this assembly line was finished and started rolling out vehicles, around 9.9 .9 in every 1,000 Americans owned an automobile. Ten years later, that number rose to 111.53 per every 1,000 Americans. So essentially, Henry Ford increased demand tenfold by lowering costs by around a third. And by increasing demand, he was able to scale up the manufacturing process and invest money into making more efficient and faster machines. At the same time, industrialists like Henry Ford were able to buy raw materials and components at a cheaper wholesale price by scaling up that demand. And if possible, his actual vendors would also have more demand, and so they might be able to streamline their process and, of course, continue giving those savings on to the consumer. This cascading effect created all sorts of new products and items that were now affordable to the average man and woman that just decades ago would have only been available for the elite and rich. 
Now let's take a look at a Star Wars platform like the TIE Fighter, which we jokingly call the Honda Civic of the Star Wars Galaxy. But it's actually a pretty apt description. I mean, a lot of people make fun of the performance of the TIE Fighter and the Honda Civic, but one should never really sleep on a twin ion engine or VTEC. There's also the perceived shoddy design and quality of these vehicles. But this is only when you compare the TIE Fighter to ships like the X-Wing or a Honda Civic to a BMW M3. The Honda Civic and the TIE Fighter were not designed for peak performance though. They weren't luxury automobiles. They were designed for the masses. They were cheap, good quality, and uh, very low maintenance. Now guys, the Republic featured a relatively free market system, but in the last few years, Chancellor Palpatine did several shady things to gain more central control over the galactic economy. We're gonna focus on three major things he did here. First, we have the Military Creation Act, which included the formation of the first federal military in Republic history since the Rusan Reformation a thousand years ago. Then we have the Republic Military Enhancement Bill, which sought to further deregulate the banking clan's ability to give out riskier loans, including a massive loan for 5 million additional clone troopers and an interest rate of 25% to the Republic, which is simply nuts, guys. Then you have the Sith orchestrated invasion of Scipio, which shook confidence in the intergalactic banking clan's ability to serve as a neutral party in the Clone Wars. They actually controlled the majority of the financial infrastructure in the galaxy, and they even controlled the printing of new Republic credits. After this incident, Emperor Palpatine would move to swiftly federalize the banks, creating a national banking system, something that would allow him to print credits, adjust interest rates, and have overall more control over economic growth and inflation. Palpatine should have been like, I love federal banking. I love printing credits. Now, in all fairness, the United States from its inception had federal banks thanks to Alexander Hamilton, and they were completely necessary in preventing our country from going bankrupt. But those banks are supposed to remain politically independent from the executive branch. They're supposed to. In Palpatine's case, though, he wanted to raise massive amounts of funds to create essentially the largest military force the galaxy had ever seen. And in his case, he had complete control over the federal banking system. There was no illusion that Palpatine was not the banks, and also the Senate. Once more, the Sith will rule the galaxy. But he faced an uphill climb. The reality was that no galactic government had ever had enough resources or military power to completely pacify the entire galaxy. And now Palpatine was going to try and use sheer will and also a lot of uh, financial engineering to make this happen. He would nationalize several starship manufacturing companies or at least secure the loyalty from their corporate boards. He would also nationalize entire planets full of resources to reduce the cost of production. And at the core of his plan was the senior fleet system TIE Fighter, which had one of the most efficient assembly lines in galactic history. The standard TIE Fighter costs around 60,000 credits new and a lot of that has to do with the twin ion engine design which is where the name TIE, by the way, comes from. This engine was one of the most mass-produced pieces of machinery in the galaxy, and therefore the design and manufacturing process had to be perfect. The result is one of the most precisely manufactured propulsion systems in Star Wars history. As a matter of fact, this engine had no moving parts, which means much less wear and tear and much longer gaps between regular maintenance. Imperial records reported that throughout the war, less than 5% of TIE fighters were lost, because of maintenance or failure uh, in components. This fighter also lacked uh, hyperdrive shields and a pressurized hull, making it very simple to construct. This, of course, was no Star Wars equivalent to the F-35. It wasn't a multi-purpose starfighter at all. The TIE Fighter was primarily used as a short-range interceptor based on larger capital ships or ground-based locations. It had limited operation range and applications, but it fit well within the Imperial Navy's doctrine, which is built around the battleship and not the carrier. A better real-life comparison to the TIE Fighter might be like the T-38 Talon or the T-7A Red Hawk. These are trainer aircraft used by the U.S. Air Force, and they're also used by some more developing countries which have smaller Air Force budgets. But still, the T-7A Red Hawk costs around $19.3 million per unit, and the T-38 costs around $756,000 in the 60s when it came out, which is equivalent to around $6 million today. Now, these two aircraft are a lot smaller, a lot simpler. They have a different role and purpose. They're either trainers or short-range interceptors, like the TIE Fighter, kind of. But this is why they cost less although they're still kind of in the same neighborhood when it comes to price, the millions. So remember that story about Henry Ford we just talked about and his Model T plant won't scale is incredibly important when determining the price of any manufactured product. 
And so as of October 2022, only 840 F-35 Lightnings have been built. How many TIE Fighters have been built? Well, there isn't an official number, but we know that the Empire has over 25,000 Imperial class Star Destroyers, and they usually carry an entire wing of standard TIE Fighters. That's around 72 ships times 25,000. And so we get an end number of around 1.8 million TIE Fighters. But that's only the number for Imperial class Star Destroyer based TIE Fighters. You have other types of destroyers. You have cruisers, carriers, frigates, you have ground installations, uh, air bases, you have space stations. So there could be like dozens of millions of TIE Fighters out there. And this is the point I'll keep hammering in. Scale matters, and simply put, super high-end, state-of-the-art fighters like the F-35 are just not going to be developed and built in the same quantity as even the least popular mainline starfighter used by any major faction in the Star Wars universe. Now, the F-35 program will get cheaper throughout the lifespan of its program, unless they like severely mess this up. But even then, we're still talking about one planet worth of jets versus an entire galaxy. There's simply a larger galactic market in Star Wars. It's not even comparable. There's also the fact that starfighter technology is considered much less leading edge than jet technology in our own world. For instance, only three countries in the world, United States, United Kingdom, and I guess it used to be Russia, were able to develop the material sciences needed to create the very, very precisely manufactured fan blades used in turbofan jet engines. It's really hard to do. The F-35 also has tons of proprietary technology inside of it that's required entirely new factories and supply chains and high-end machinery investments to set up. It's all ridiculously expensive. Whereas senior fleet systems and Incom and Quad Systems Engineering all can depend on a 25,000 year old starship manufacturing industry. I mean, it's basically all there. When did the Wright brothers first fly their wooden kite with a small engine on it? A bit over a century ago? Now in the Star Wars universe, you are gonna see ships that are priced very similar to an F-35. It's usually ships like the custom-made Shimitar, which was a heavily modified Star Courier valued at around 55,000 credits. It's kind of close to the $80 million that the F-35 is. The reason why the Shimitar was so expensive was that it featured a state-of-the-art Stygium cloaking device, which made the ship invisible to the naked eye. And so R&D costs money. Setting up new supply chains and building new factories costs a lot of money. And military aircraft in our own world weren't always that expensive. If you take a look at late era piston driven uh, propeller airplanes like the P-51 Mustang, it cost around, I don't know, $50,000 in the 1940s. That's only around a million dollars in today's money. This wasn't just a simple trainer fighter either. It was the premier bomber escorter designed by the United States to protect its massive fleet of strategic bombers. Over 15,000 of these units were built and a combination of well-tested and older technology combined with larger production numbers is what made the P-51 considerably cheaper than something like the F-35. There's also a huge issue with the United States military industrial complex and its bidding system. There's also the issue of design flaws and maintenance issues that should be solved throughout the lifespan of a fighter platform as we mentioned before. But yeah, there are a lot of different factors, uh, you know, coming into play here. But yeah, these are the general reasons why an X-Wing costs only $175,000 and an F-35 costs north of $80 million. So I guess, guys, that means my conversion rate checks out. See you next time.